During the lockdown, obviously due to the coronavirus pandemic, we have not been allowed in the club to do any filming. So we've hit on the idea of doing some filming in my back garden and see if we can answer a few of your questions. Hopefully it won't be too long before we get the queue out and pot them as it says on this mug which is a present from a, a neighbour but there's no guarantee of that so in the meantime just to let you know I haven't gone away we'll get on with the questions. The first question comes from Nico it would be great if you could give us some more ideas that we could practice at home because I think a lot of players now have no access to a snooker table at the moment. I appreciate how difficult it is when you haven't got a table to practice on. I, I certainly find it difficult um, to, first of all, to, to motivate myself. All I've got is an ironing board, you know, that I set up the same height as a snooker table and I practice my cueing, right? But I like to think I'm not an absolute beginner. And for you beginners, I, would, I really can't emphasize enough the value of just putting yourself on video, right? How you stand, where you hold that cue, how you hold that cue, which eye is dominant, are you using it correctly? Right, all these aspects come into it, and if you put yourself on video, and we've all got one of these these days, haven't we? These smartphones they've got access to a video and access to playback. This is a feedback for you, you know, how you grip the cue, how does Ronnie grip the cue, how does Judd Trump or Kyron Wilson grip the cue? Have a look at them on video. Compare it with your grip, right? Now, I'm not saying everybody grips it the same. Of course they don't. Everybody's anatomically slightly different. But the basics are there. So when you come back to this grip here, if we look here, have I got enough room between this hand and my body to get me, to allow me to have the follow through? All right? So that's point one. The second point is, have a look at that grip, the formation of it. So we're going from here, here, pull it in, look how I'm holding it with this part of the hand, I'm into here, yeah, touching, touching, touching. They never actually come off the cue. And then as you close the hand, the cue, the hand goes forward to the body, here, all right? And then you should finish with that hand closed here. Now some players have the ability to go past the chest and keep it straight. If you're a beginner, <laughs> that is very difficult to do. Yeah, the chest is your friend. Let's use it as much as we can. All right. Again, we come back to queuing. You know, find something with a hole in it. The handle of a cup. Good idea to cue through it. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of objects. You know, a young lad of mine that I, I have coached, he, he used the hole in a roll of sellotape. There are 101 items out there with a hole in that you can use. All right, just practice your cueing. The next thing, have a look at your stance. Is the, your right leg straight? If you're right-handed, that is. Left leg if you're left-handed. But these things are, are important aspects to try and stay still. Is your head moving on the, on, the, on the shot, during the shot? When you lift your eyes, some people don't just lift their eyes, they lift their head. Not a good idea. Look for these little aspects on video. All right. good luck with your practice. I hope I'm pronouncing the next fellow's name correctly. Silvio, he's asking, is it imperative that the height of the table at home to be the same height as a snooker table? The height of a snooker table from the floor to the top of the cushion rail is two foot nine and a half to two foot ten and a half. All right. Now, OK, you've got an inch tolerance there. Let me just tell you a little something that I, I, I was aware of and witnessed actually. 
several years ago at Stoke-on-Trent. I was playing snooker on a table next to Ray Reardon, who was six times world champion. Ray was practicing with, a, with his regular partner and he wasn't playing particularly well. And he had a conversation with his partner and he put it down to an exhibition that he played the night before. And during this exhibition, it became apparent that the floor was slightly uneven. So the table was higher or appeared higher at one end, one end than it did at the other because they'd had to pack it up. Now, he was sort of off balance, shall we say, playing from this side as he was from the other side. And this was off, although he adjusted during the, uh, the exhibition, it affected his form the following day. So it took him a while to get used to the proper conditions again. So whilst it's not absolutely critical, it is fairly important. All right, so ideally, if you can get within that tolerance of two foot nine and a half to two foot ten and a half, that's where I, what I should aim for. The next question comes from Reza, who shares my belief that it's important to have fixed points, but he wants me to explain a little bit more about the fixed points of the body. When I say the body is a fixed point, does it mean the whole body or the arm and chest? Which part of the body should be fixed? Well, again, it comes back to the anatomy of every individual. Yeah. Ideally, what we have when I talk about fixed points, I talk about a fixed point, the bridge. All right. A fixed point, the hand, where it, where it is holding the cue, because that is going to determine you follow through up to a point. Some players will go there, alter the grip and go past the chest. All right. If you can do that, great. Ronnie O'Sullivan certainly can on some shots. Yeah, and get through the ball straight. But coming back to this fixed point, yeah, we've got a guide here. The chest, the cue is rubbing on the chest. We use that as your friend, All right? But if you start moving it around, yeah, then it's not your friend, it's your enemy. We need to stay still there. But if the cue happens to, you know, if you can keep the cue there without tension, that's fine. But if it also just rises a bit or drops down a bit during your cue in action, that's no big problem. All right, we're getting a little bit too pedantic, shall we say, you know. It's a guide. Let your natural ability come out. Yeah, don't be too fixed about this. All right. Yes, we use it as a guide, but if it drops a little during your cueing or raises a little during your cueing, so what? Doesn't matter that much. Cueing straight is what matters. All right. Consistently. Yeah. So don't try under stress to keep it in that one place. It'll only it start to include tension in your in your cueing. Tension in any form will put you off. There is no way should you include tension. In most sports, you know, we try to get rid of tension. Yeah, and cueing at snooker is no different. Please don't include tension to try and keep that cue there. Relax. And just let it happen. Good luck with your practice. I've had uh, a couple of questions. One uh, asking if it's beneficial to play on a table with pockets, uh, the opening of which is 65 millimeter, I think it was, and the other one uh, about the benefit of playing on a smaller table, say a six by three. Well, if we relate them both together, surely the 65 mil that would be on a small table as well, because that is awfully small, and the balls are going to be small. So you wouldn't get those size pockets on a, on a full size table. They would only be on a smaller table. So let, let's be honest here. Um, I have often said that it, playing on anything, even on grass, is more beneficial than not playing at all. 
So if all you've got is a 6x3 table or, or a table with smaller pockets and smaller balls, yes, have some fun uh, and learn from what you're doing. There is no doubt that when you swap to the full-size table with the full-size balls, then you're going to have to make some adaptations. But even most of the pros, not all, but most of the pros, certainly years ago, as children, they started on a tabletop. You know, six by three, that I certainly did. When I was a youngster, my father got a second-hand table. Um, he renovated it himself. It, the cushions were catapult elastic, right? And he did that. We didn't have any money. He just renovated it the best we could. And that's how we had a, good, a lot of fun. And even brought my friends around for a game of snooker. So practicing on these tables, fine. But don't just mess around. You know, this, this is where you can learn. So make sure you do it properly. Have a good bridge. Check your positions here. Have I got enough room for a follow through? All these aspects. There's no need just to knock balls around. You can learn and you can practice on these tables. All right? But please take <laughs> take it into consideration that once you go on the 12 by 6 yeah, you are going to find it rather awkward. Uh, I mean, the first time I went on one after playing on that tabletop, I thought I was on a football field. All right? No doubt you're going to have this, this same sort of criteria coming to your well-being. But enjoy it, practice on it, and it will have some, some merit at least. Good luck with your practice. The next one relates to a debate you often hear in the clubs, and it comes from Robert. He's, out, he's saying that he agrees that most club tables have bigger pockets, although not all. I do think pockets seem bigger than they used to be though, even five to ten years ago. Do I think that the cloths have anything to do with it, i.e. new cloths helping the ball to slide in off the cushion? Uh, with club tables, you know, generally being more generous, but not in not every case, because some of them are very tight, I've played on some of them. but. You know, the, the, the authorities have come up with these templates and whilst they they might look as though the pro tables are, are generous, I can assure you they're not. Now, let's go back to what you're seeing on the television. Yes, once you've got a brand new table on, uh, a brand new cloth on that table, there is a sheen on it. And if you play at the right pace, which is so important, the right pace then this sheen on that cushion rail will help the ball to slide in, shall we say. If that cloth is on, uh, we'll say, a, a few days, you know, even on the pro tables, and that sheen starts to dissipate without altering the, table, the, the pocket size at all, that table starts to play tighter. And, and this is why... You know, they, they change the cloth, or one of the reasons. Now, let's not forget that snooker is an entertainment. It's not just a sport, it's also an entertainment. And people do like to see big breaks. Um, but <laughs> you get a, somebody like Judd Trump or, or Ronnie O'Sullivan and put him on your club table where you're making 20 breaks, rest assured, they will still make the centuries. All right? So... Yes, they do appear to be a little bit generous, but they conform to the templates. Now, the other side of that, what, it, what I would like to say, is that the camera, they, they, they really emphasise anything. You know, they, they've had cameras in the, in the black ball pockets, and you see the ball coming in. Yeah, coming into the pocket, and it looks as though it's not going to go in, and then it drops. Well... You know, if you've got a pimple on your nose, <laughs> you've got that camera pinpointing on that pimple, it will look like a massive wart. Yeah, this is the effect of the camera work. You know, those pockets are not generous, I can assure you. They are very tight. All right. 
Sefian goes on to say, Is it not good to practice on a medium snooker table rather than the big one? For me, it's no different because the technique, the cue action and break building I'm working on remains the same. Whilst there's a lot of benefit from playing on that medium sized table, as I've said, it's, you know, practicing on anything is better than nothing. But once you get onto the, the full size table, the white ball is traveling bigger distances. The object ball is traveling bigger distances. So it examines your technique more. If we look at good long potters in the pro game, such as Sean Murphy, Neil Robertson, Kyron Wilson, fantastic long potters over 11 and 10 foot of distance, but they never get them all. That player hasn't been born yet, and it's my belief he never will. But if you reduce that distance down to four and five foot, yeah, you know, more or less get under 100% of these long pots. If we can call them long pots over that distance. But you see what I'm saying. Now, I agree, there's a lot of benefit from practicing your break building on this medium sized table. But I'm sure that once you go to the full size table, you'll notice one heck of a difference. The next question relates to people who are very tall. And this one comes from Reese, who's six foot five. And he was using a 58 inch cue. And he thought that it was a bit short to use as he couldn't get a long backspin. So he's now purchased a cue 60 inches long. He understands that everyone is different, but wants to know if this sounds about right for him. Well, I don't quite see how the 58 inches if I'm holding it on the end, affects the length of the backswing. What it will do is affect the length of the follow-through. So if I'm holding on the end of the cue and I'm there, then obviously that distance there becomes my follow-through unless I go past the chest, which can cause a lot of problems. So extending the length of the cue now brings that cue to there and I can get more follow through without going past the chest. So I believe you're on the right lines here, Reese, by going for a cue 60 inches long. That will give you more follow through, providing you hold it in the right position. And don't for, please don't forget the position of where you put your bridge hand or whether you play with a straight arm or a bent arm will affect this distance here and the amount of follow through have a look at my video which covers that all right but i do believe you're on the right lines somebody of your height you do need a longer queue what i would ask you to consider though is that the longer that piece of wood generally speaking not always tends to get a little bit whippy so please be careful on that all right, good luck with that practice, Reese. Lots of players want to know about cue power. And Nabdul is asking the question, I just wanted to know what people telling him to hit from the elbow and to draw the power, or from the shoulder to draw the power. He wants to know how he does that. Well, when he's talking about power, surely he's talking about cue power. Right, cue power is what matters, not hitting the ball hard. All right, and he's, he's being advised to hit from the elbow, in other words, keep the elbow high and do it this way, or to some are saying drop the elbow to create the power. Right, I'm not in favor of saying that you must do that or you must do this. Natural ability comes in here. Right, whatever suits you is right. But the one thing you have to do is to allow the cue to do the work. All right, it's this cue that gives you the power. All right, so if you have a short backswing here and now you try to introduce power, that's muscle action. All right, 
There's no way will you generate Q power. Yes, you'll hit the ball hard, but that's that's not Q power. All right? The length of the swing is what gives you the Q power. You're allowing the Q to do the work from here. It doesn't really matter whether you keep the, the elbow high or you drop it. What matters is that backswing and allowing the cue to do the work. So I would urge you, and I really mean this, I would urge you to go back to basics. Have a look at my video, which covers the grip, the unfurling of these fingers, right, and then closing the fingers, bringing the hand forward to the chest. All right, that's where your power comes from, not from a short backswing and allowing those muscles to generate it. No, no, no. That's not the answer at all. Watch the pros. They don't hit the ball hard unless, you know, the, the, the odd shot demands it. Of course it does. But generally speaking, they stroke the ball. They allow the cue to do the work. Watch Ronnie, length of the backswing. Sean Murphy, Neil Robertson, Kyron Wilson. They let the cue do the work, not their muscles. Using your muscles will create errors. Please. Learn to generate it, allowing the cue to do the work. Good luck with that practice.